Come on in, pull up a chair and take a load off because today I'll be sharing a bit of a how to play as well as my review of Imperium Classics from Osprey Games. Is this ancient history themed deck building game deserving of a place in your collection? Or should this design be exiled to the rubble of forgotten civilizations of the past? Well, you're going to find out right after this. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang channel. As I mentioned in the open, I am going to be reviewing Imperium Classics in just a moment. But first, I do want to point out, I am still recovering from the triple bypass surgery that I had just over three weeks ago. And my voice is still not back to normal. It is uh, pretty raspy. It's kind of weak, too. So do apologize for that. Uh, hopefully, my voice can, can hold out throughout this entire review. Anyway, that said, I am going to be reviewing Imperium Classics from Osprey Games. It's designed by Nigel Buckle and David Turksey with artwork provided by the Miko. The game is for one to four players, ages 14 and up, plays in about 40 minutes per player, and it does carry an MSRP of $40. So let's swing on over to the other camera because I've got Imperium Classics kind of set up here. Uh, I have my player area set up. I also have the market and the decks all set up as well. We're going to kind of tour around. I'm going to talk about this in depth. I do want to mention, though, I, this is not going to be a an extreme deep dive into the gameplay of Imperium Classics. But before we get started, let me point out that the fine folks over at Osprey Games were kind enough to send me this review copy. But neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share my thoughts about this game. These days, it's important for you to know that. All right, so Imperium Classics is a kind of empire building deck builder game. There's some resource management. There's a bit of engine building in this as well. There are eight civilizations contained within Classics, and we've got... Uh, the Carthaginians, we've got the Celts, we've got Greeks, we've got the Macedonians, we have Persians, we have Scythians, Romans, I don't think I said Romans, as well as Vikings. So each of these empires are going to play a bit differently. The decks for the empires are asymmetrical. And it's one of the aspects of this game that I really do like is that depending on what empire you take on is really going to determine the way you're going to approach this game in order to play. Do have to mention, it takes a little bit of time to set up the game because you're going to actually set up your, your empire area with your empire deck. You also have to set up the market. You have to set up the decks up here as well. And I'll get into uh, more detail about that in just a moment. So we've got the rule book, and it's pretty well put together. I do have to point out, it's not as intuitive as I would have liked to have seen. I did have some questions about the game even after going through the rule book a couple of times. But uh, I figured it out, and we were able to jump in and uh, get some gameplay in. And you'll notice that there are a lot of notes. There are uh, keywords that are very important throughout the game. Some you're going to run across a lot. Others, not so much. We also get a bit of a discussion about the various nations that come in classics. There is also Imperium Legends, which has some fictional 
civilizations as well as historical civilizations as well. So legends also includes like uh, King Arthur, Egypt, uh, Egypt uh, Atlanteans, uh, the uh, the Qin dynasty from China. So it's it's kind of an, uh, a strange mix of fictional and historical empires. Do you want to mention, as far as I understand, the the decks in Legends are a little more difficult to uh, to play than the ones that are in the uh, classics release. So rulebook is uh, pretty in depth. There's a lot going on there. Do you want to also mention there is solitaire play for Imperium, which is, in my opinion, a very big selling point for this game. And you can play, you're going to pick whatever civilization you want, and then you're going to choose another civilization to go up against. And you're going to create a bot. Give me an example. That's the bot set up for the uh, opponent. You're going to set up your empire the same way you normally would. So I have played the solo game once and got thrashed. So, but this is the layout as far as multiple players. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your deck, your empire deck. And here I am actually taking on the Carthaginians. So yes, Hamilcar and Hannibal. It got kind of zoned out there for a minute. So first of all, you're going to have a power card. And we're going to zoom in and get a closer look at the cards once I kind of explain how the game is played. And there's two sides to it. And each side has a different special ability. When you're first learning the game, it's recommended that you utilize the B side. We also do have our deck. We're going to have our starting deck of cards. It's going to have a variety of different cards in here, including Unrest, which is kind of junk cards. This is a deck builder. And of course, more Unrest in your deck gums up the works. Plus, there are also negative victory points at the end of the game. So you want to try to stay away from Unrest cards, although each civilization is going to start with some Unrest. So we've got a few different cards here. Once again, as I mentioned, the uh, empires that you play are going to be asymmetrical. So some of them will have bigger decks and fewer nation cards, which are these face down cards here, while others will have more cards in this deck and fewer nation cards. So what you're going to do is you're going to play through your, your deck. And every time you have to reshuffle, you are going to add a card from your nation deck. And these are more advanced cards for you to utilize. Once you've gone through all of these cards and you have this face-up card left, this is actually going to go into your hand and you are going to move from being a barbarian empire to an actual empire. So you'll notice on some of these cards, we have these little axes that indicates that that is a barbarian card. Here we see this almost like a crown. That's, that's a civilized card that is an empire card. So you have to earn your spot in history. So you're going to have to unlock these cards. So, of course, to do that, you need to cycle through your deck of cards as quickly as you possibly can. We also have developments. This is some additional advanced technologies and things like that that can be unlocked and built as well. Once all these cards are gone from your nation deck, you have these developments. So every time you would cycle through your deck, you're actually going to take one of these and add it to your deck as well. So here we also have the our state card, which is going to show, are we barbarian or are we an empire? 
So you'll notice we have these tokens here. Some of them have X's on them. Some of them have circles on them. The X's are exhaust tokens. So we will have some cards that will show the keyword exhaust, which means we can exhaust that card to do whatever special ability that card has. We also have action tokens, and we have three action tokens as well. So each turn, if you decide you want to take actions and exhaust cards, you can. That is known as uh, activating. So when it's your turn, you have three different things you can do. You can activate, which is going to allow you to play cards, take actions, of course, exhaust cards as well. And once you do that, then you'll move on to cleanup. If you're not going to do that, you can also innovate. So if you're going to innovate, you're going to take your hand of cards, which you're going to have five cards normally, and you're just going to discard your entire hand, and you're going to be able to do what's known as a breakthrough. So with a breakthrough, you're able to take a card from the market. You can either take a face-up card from the market, or you can take a face-down card from the market, except for these cards. These are fame cards. These are special cards. You actually have to, to play a card to be able to, to choose fame cards. And it's very self-explanatory. Most of the uh, empires will have a glory card that they can unlock at some point, which will allow them to get the fame cards. So a breakthrough allows you to take either face up or face down. And you notice we have unrest cards up here. Unrest cards can be added into your deck and unrest cards also come with any uncivilized, which is here, civilized or tributary, which is the blue cards, which are kind of uh, nations that you've conquered or nations who are paying tribute to you. So you'll notice tucked underneath these cards are unrest cards. Now you can acquire cards from the market. If you acquire cards, then you must take the unrest card that is included with that. If you have a breakthrough, you do not have to take the unrest card the unrest card will stay there. So once again, you can innovate, you can discard all five cards from your hand, and then you're able to do a breakthrough to take either a region, uncivilized, civilized, or tributary. So this deck up here is what's called the main deck. And depending on the number of players, You'll take cards out of these decks, including your empire, uh, just to kind of shrink things down a little bit. But one of the ways that the game will end is if the main deck runs out. So we only have a few cards in the region, uncivilized and civilized areas here. When these decks run out, you'll actually be drawing from the main deck. So as an example, if you were looking for uncivilized, you're going to look through this deck until you get the first uncivilized. That's going to go here. Or if you're doing a breakthrough, you would be taking it if these decks are empty. Kind of an oddball sort of mechanic there. I would have liked to have seen these decks be a little bigger because they start off with six cards and then you put one of the cards down here. Uh, this actually gets two. I would like to have seen these bigger, this a little shorter, a little smaller, and then have something along the lines of, if this deck runs out, that triggers the end game. If all three of these decks run out, it triggers the end game. Something along those lines. So let's talk a little bit about the end game, because there's a few different ways for you to trigger the end of Imperium Classics. First is unrest. If all these unrest cards are gone, if they have all been 
divvied out. They're all in everybody's decks or what have you. If there are no unrest cards left here, that is going to trigger collapse. And this is pretty easy to figure out who the victor is in a collapse. Each of the players is going to look through, count up all the unrest cards that they have. And whoever has the fewest unrest cards is the winner. In the case of a tie, then you're going to count up victory points, which is usually how you will resolve games of Imperium Classics. Another way that you can activate the end game is if all the fame cards are gone and one of the empires has activated the King of Kings card, it gets flipped over, you finish up your turn, and everybody gets another turn. So you can have more than one player actually utilize this card. It's just the first player gets uh, kind of a better bonus with the King of Kings. And then what will happen here is you will total up all of your victory points. And whoever's got the most victory points is the winner. So that is uh, another way that we can do that as well. Another activating uh, circumstances, if all your development cards are gone, if an empire has, has actually emptied out their development deck, then that will activate an end game as well. You're going to count up all of your victory points for that. Uh, the Vikings have a special victory condition as well. I have not played as the Vikings, so I can't really get into a whole lot of detail with that. I know in the uh, Legends set, I want to say it's the Aetherians and I think the Utopians also have different win conditions as well to activate the end game. So there's a few different things that are going on in the game as well. So we've got some tokens also. We have population, we have progress, and we have materials. So to kind of give you an idea of how you would play is you're going to draw five cards to start off. So you're going to draw five cards from your deck. Oh, look, I've got a glory card right off the bat. So I've got one unrest card. out of this uh i should point out before i jump into this the third option you have so you can either activate which is what i'm going to show you what i'm going to do here with the carthaginians you can innovate which is when you you would just say okay i'm just discarding my whole hand and then you get to do the breakthrough but there's also revolt and with Revolt, you can take as many unrest cards that are in your hand and return them to the supply. So that's something you want to keep in mind if you get to the point where there's very few unrest cards. And there are civilizations that really do depend on unrest in order to win. The Celts are a great example. The Celts uh, are a great example of actually providing a lot of unrest to the other players' decks. So uh, that is one of the ways that they try to push for a win. So if you notice there's very few unrest cards, you're probably going to want to look at taking a revolt action. So that is basically you're just going to discard the unrest cards, and that's it. You don't get to do any actions, anything like that. That is your turn. Just like with the Innovate, you don't get to take actions. You don't get to exhaust anything. You're just simply going to be uh, performing the breakthrough and taking a card. All right, so we got the Unrest. The Unrest doesn't really do anything. There's ways to get rid of the Unrest outside of the Revolt action. It's kind of expensive. So we're going to put that off to the side. I've got Conquer, which allows me to pay two population to acquire a region. 
or tributary, or I can pay three population to break through for a region or a tributary. So that's consideration. I've got glory. This card can't be garrisoned. And I'll talk about garrisoning cards in a moment. Uh, abandon three regions to look at the top two cards of the uh, fame deck. Take one of those cards. Well, I don't have any regions, so that's not going to happen. So I've got Dido, Queen of Carthage. So I can gain a population. I can acquire a region and play it free immediately. And then this card goes into my history. So that's very interesting. I like that. We've got Mauritania, which is a region. And it's got a little like money sack here, which doesn't really do anything. Other cards will activate some of these little icons here. So when I play that, I can gain two material and I can garrison a card. So I could garrison a card underneath this. So what I think I'm going to do is I am going to use an action and I am going to play Mauritania. So you're going to have an area. Usually it's going to be on top of your empire setup. But I'm going to put this off to, excuse me, to the side here. So I'm going to play Mauritania. So that's going to allow me to gain two material, which is material is a big deal with the Carthaginians because I actually will get victory points for every three material I have at the end of the game. Normally population and materials don't give you victory points. Progress does. Each progress counter gets you a victory point at the end of the game. You can also spend progress as if it were one population point or two materials. So try not to you try not to spend these because those victory points will add up. All right, so I gained my two. I can garrison a card. I might as well garrison an unrest card. So even though it's I still have it, and it would still be worth minus two victory points, I'm at least getting it out of my deck by garrisoning it. So to garrison, you're just going to put it underneath. Now, sometimes you'll have cards that'll say exile, a card from the market. It's basically like a discard pile. You put them over there. All right, so I also have Conquer, and I've got, I, I'm going to play Dido. So I'm going to play Dido here. So I'm going to gain a population. And I can acquire. Now remember, acquiring is this. I have to take the face up. I can acquire a region and play it free. So it's a free play. It does not count as an action. Playing Dido counts as an action. That's why I just did that. And it says, put this card into your history. All right, so I'm going to take Woodland. I'm going to play that as a free play. You'll notice uh, some of these cards have a little icon. It's almost like an infinity icon. That means it's pinned. It means when it's the card is played, it stays out. Uh, there are ways to regain these cards, put them back into your deck, and uh, you'll do that quite often. All right, so I played that, got that, and I'm going to put this card in my history. So when I take a card and put it in my history, it goes under my power card, under my empire card, essentially. So those are two of my actions. I have one action left. And I am going to play Conquer. I need to replace this, though. And I am going to actually pay three population for a breakthrough. And I'm going to take this step, step card here. And this goes into my hand. So that's one of the aspects that's different as far as deck building games go with Imperium is that when you gain a card, it goes into your hand it does not go into your discard pile. So that's important to keep in mind. Something else. 
I've got the little barbarian axes on this card. If I were to become an empire, I would not be able to utilize that anymore. I could only use cards that show this. So kind of an interesting aspect as well. So like all deck builders, what you're doing is you're gaining cards, but you're also looking at ways to trim cards out of your deck. All right, so that is my discard pile. You know what? I'll put my discard pile here so I don't mix it up with this stuff here. So I used all my actions. I didn't have anything that I could use to exhaust. So don't have to worry about these exhaust tokens. So now that I've done that, now I would move to cleanup. And in cleanup, what you would normally do with most empires is, I need to replace that. Oh, the Hittites. There you go. There's a tributary who are worth victory points. So you'll notice, see these little gold circles here with the victory points. You want, you want to score these victory points. So anyway, normally what would happen is your empire is going to place a progress token on any of the cards in the market. Uh, and then that's going to end your turn. With the Carthaginians, though, what they actually do is they actually place two material on a card. So a lot of times what you're looking to do is you're looking at cards that maybe you don't want your opponent to be taking and you'll put your progress or in this case, your materials on a card that you would prefer your opponents to take. So this is a little bit of an incentive in order to maybe get the players to, to stay away from cards that you want. So uh, what I will do here is I will put this on shrine on the shrine card, kind of tempt somebody to take this, even though it does have an unrest card. So I would do that. I take my actions back and that would be the end of my turn. So it would move on to the next player. We'd go around and then we have a solstice card. So the solstice card is going to go on the table between the last player and the first player. And once that last player has finished their cleanup, and it's going to go to the, the first player again. Before you do that, you're going to have a solstice phase. Now, some cards will show solstice. So for an example here, Metropolis says solstice. Choose to gain either one population or gain one material or draw a card. So if this card was in play for an empire and we got to the solstice phase, then what they would be doing is they would get a choice to do that. So as your empire grows, you are going to find that you will have things that take place during the solstice phase. But as of right now, I would have nothing going on. So goes around the table, comes back to my turn again, just for the heck of it. Let's just say we're playing four players. Let's throw some progress out here just for the heck of it. So, oh, the, the last thing you do with your, your cleanup is you, you draw your cards. So you draw up the five. So you draw back up the five cards. Now there are things that can happen during other players turns, which will have you draw cards. If that's the case, then you simply draw a card. You're going to start off with more than five cards in your turn. So as you notice, I have now drawn five cards. I no longer have any cards in my deck. And I've got my discard pile over here. So let's say it's my turn again. So I would have an unrest card. I have prosperity. All players may draw a card. See, once again, there's an example of drawing cards when it's not your turn. Uh, choose to gain one material per money bag or gain one 
uh, population per region I have in play. I like that. I'll be playing that. We've got uh, another region available to us as well. And I also have Carthaginian Traders, which is a free play. So I'll be able to play that as a free action. All right. So let's see what we've got. How would I go about doing? Oh, I also have Advance, which allows me to pay three material to acquire either a, an uncivilized or civilized. Or I can pay five material to get to break through like here. Uh, I have five material. I think I'll play the advance as an action and pay all my material here because I've got some cards to get some stuff back. And I'm actually going to do a breakthrough for uncivilized. Uh, you know what? I think I'm going to take the rituals and ceremonies. So remember... I'm paying for a breakthrough, so I don't have to take that unrest card. So I'm going to replace that with an ambassador. So this is going to go in my hand. And as you can see, this is a free play. So I will play a free play, the rituals and ceremonies, so I can return an unrest card. So when you're returning an unrest, it goes back to the supply. Even though this came out of your deck, you can still return that to the supply. Now, when you're done playing, there there are some times that, like for an example, the Carthaginians, they can export cards to other players. So I can get rid of cards I don't want later on as the Empire is developed. So at the end of the game, you're going to have to go through and make sure that you put the decks back together correctly. All right, so I'll do that. I'll play that as an unrest. So I can also return an exhausted to my state card. Well, I haven't done anything to do that. All right, so I've played one of my actions. I think I'll play another free play. And I'm going to add a material to any card in the market. And let's just go with ah what the heck we'll go with the shrine all right so remember that was a free play so now this is another action i'm going to play prosperity all players may draw a card so all the other players would draw a card including me i don't have any cards so what's going to happen here is I'm going to take one of the cards from the nation deck because I've cycled through my deck. This is going to go into, uh, into my draw pile. I'm going to draw a card. I got conquer back. I can choose to gain one material per money bag, which I would have two, or I can get, to population. I Basically, I could get a population for each region. I think I'm going to take the population. So I'm going to go with that. So I still have one action left. And I think I will just be simply playing this region to put that in play. So actually, I would probably just put it alongside there. Just like that. So that's pretty much how you're going to play the game. You're going to cycle through your deck. You're going to unlock your nation cards, which makes your um, makes you more powerful. You're going to get to the your your specific end card for your nation deck, which has a little dot down at the bottom. And once you unlock this and add this to your deck. That's when you're going to go from Barbarian to Empire, keeping in mind you can no longer play Barbarian cards. 
So you're also going to sit there and once you've done that and you're an empire, you're going to be looking to develop your various different empire cards. So for an example here, I've got trading ships, Hannibal, elephants, monopoly, hegemony, and another elephant. So, so you'll have some attack cards. Like for an example, I don't start getting attack cards until I become an empire. And the attack cards are not super powerful. Usually some of them can affect all the players. And uh, one of the aspects of the game that I really do like is that you really can't just sit there and gang up on one other player. Usually when you're doing things, they're all going to count against everybody else. So that's one of the aspects I do like. And the, there's no, there's really not a lot of take that to the game. Uh, because when you're like playing attacks or you're playing cards, they're detrimental to everybody. People aren't going to get all upset anyway. So you're going to try to do all your developments here. Cause that'll trigger the end game, or you're going to try to trigger the King of Kings card in order to, to trigger the end game with that, or play through all these cards or depending on what empire you might be playing, you'll maybe have different end game circumstances as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in so I can show these cards off because these cards are pretty cool. I'm not going to show off a bunch. Just get a little closer in there. So uh, I did an unboxing on the gaming gang dispatch so we took a look at all the decks so if you want to check out the live show that i did that i will actually link in the uh, description where you can go take a peek at that just kind of show off some of the artwork here see here you've got your your victory points so what'll happen with a lot of cards here we go here's a great example so here's elephants right so if i had paid to develop it which would cost me three population. Then I would be able to use this. It says each other player abandons a region. You may break through for a region or tributary. And then you put this card in your history. So basically it's out of play, but it's in your history. And now you're going to get those victory points. So you're going to get those victory points added in. Uh, you're going to add up victory points that are part of your deck. You're going to add up victory points that are in cards in play. So for an example, if this stayed in play like this, that would count as minus two victory points. You will not count victory points from cards that you did not unlock. So if you haven't unlocked nation cards or you haven't uh, unlocked your development cards and they have victory points you do not score those victory points at the end of the game all right so I'll give you show you a little more artwork here on the cards got monopoly hegemony here's hannibal another aspect of the game that i do like is that uh there are some historical adversaries that are included in this set so you've got rome and carthage you've got persia and uh, macedonia so i like the fact that you've got some of these uh classic very classic uh adversaries that you can play as well all right so let's swing on over to the other camera because i will share my final thoughts and give this a review score I really like Imperium Classics. I thought it was very cool. It's not going to be for everybody. It is certainly not going to be for everybody because uh, there's some abstraction to it. You're not really sitting when when you like attack other players with attack cards. You're 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 never going to really like knock them out of the game. 
you really can't knock your opponents out. So I know some players out there, they want to be able to crush their enemies. That's not going to take place in this game. The rules do take a little bit of uh, wrapping your head around. I would have liked to have seen a much clearer rule book for uh, Imperium as well. The rule book covers both games. It covers classics as well as legends. So it is, uh, it's the same uh, rule book, essentially, for both releases. All in all, we've had a good time with this. I like the fact that each of the empires plays differently. So if you're playing as Rome, you're going to look to expand as much as you possibly can. For an example, I was playing Carthaginians. I'm actually looking to get materials and trade and establish like trade monopolies with my development cards. And once again, at the end of the game, I get victory points for extra materials that I've got left over. So you've got that. The Celts, they approach the game by, by trying to, uh, like I said, a lot of times you're going to push for that unrest. So you're going to try to push unrest into other players' decks so that you've got the collapse end game to, uh, to possibly win that way as well. So I really do like that. I like that there's, there's a lot of cool little aspects. If you're familiar with ancient history, you're kind of like, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, that's cool. Oh, I can't believe they included that. So I like, like that as well. This game has a lot of replayability, too. Not only because you've got eight different empires that you can utilize, there's also the solo game with the bot where you can use your empire and go head to head against any of the other empires as well. Of course, if you include legends with this, that unlocks 16 empires grand total. All right. Anyway, on a scale of one to 10, I give Imperium Classics a very, very solid nine out of 10. We've enjoyed it that much. Once again, as I mentioned, it's kind of abstract and, and the rules can be a little wonky as you're reading them, but we've enjoyed it a lot. Those of you looking for like a, a real detailed simulation of, of empire building during the ancient period, no, this isn't going to scratch that itch. But for the rest of us, I think this is an excellent buy and I definitely do recommend it. All right, that is it for this time out. Once again, let me point out, if you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. will not only let you know when I upload videos such as this review, but also tell you when my live stream, the Gaming Gang Dispatch, airs right here on YouTube. And it is returning July 5th. Probably not four days a week, probably a couple of days a week as I kind of get back in the swing of things following my triple bypass. All right. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thank you so much for joining me. And until next time, here's hoping you have a lot of great gaming with your gang. Oh, you're still here. Well, while you're kicking it, how about subscribing to the Gaming Gang channel or seeing the latest episode of the Gaming Gang Dispatch or finding out what YouTube recommends you check out here at my channel. And of course, don't forget, get your geek on at thegaminggang.com.